You're listening to episode 199 of Mid-America Reformed Seminary's Roundtable Podcast. In this broadcast, the faculty of Mid-America discuss theology and cultural issues from a Reformed perspective. I'm Jared Luchibor, Director of Marketing. Thank you for tuning in. Our resident professor of church history, Dr. Alan Strange, is back with me to talk about the Middle Ages and in this episode about the decline and fall of the Roman Empire and the conversion of the tribes. Dr. Strange, how are you? I'm doing very well, Jared. Um, um, I suppose uh, this is appropriate because uh, I'm in my later Middle Ages <laughs> myself. That's an interesting the, – the, 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 in terms of our, our development – uh, my wife and I have had some interesting conversations about how they keep pushing back what what is denominated as one's middle age. Right. I, I guess as we as uh, life expectancy has increased, uh, that increases. Uh, but at any rate, well, you have um, Reformation to look for. So. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, we're still in the earlier Middle Ages, so uh, yeah. I'm definitely not in my early <laughs> Middle Ages. Um, Dr. Strange, uh, we want to look today at the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Can you tell us uh, very briefly about the decline of the Roman Empire? Yes. Well, there's obviously, I think you use that adjective, excuse me, that adverb advisedly, because uh, there's a lot one could say, right? Uh, Edward Gibbon wrote uh, six massive volumes wow. on the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Let me just say this. Beginning in the aftermath of the reign of Marcus Aurelius, he died in 180, Diocletian, um, who reigned, the emperor who reigned from 284 to 305, had divided the empire in the east and west, each with its own Augustus and Caesar, uh, you had an Augustus and Caesar in both halves, as well as an imperial imperial bureaucracy. Constantine reunited it by conquest and became sole emperor after 324, but it was split again by his sons. Um, he did create, Constantine did create Constantinople to be the capital in 330, serving as the new Rome, the old Rome being rent with internal political quarrels and being too distant from the new military fronts in Syria and along the Danube. Uh, Rome as a city then, and the Western Empire as a whole, was on the wane, we might say, in the late 3rd and 4th centuries, well before the barbarian invasions began. Um, Milan, in, fl- in fact, replaced Rome in 286 as the imperial residence, and Ravenna became the seat of of the Western Empire in 402. So even Rome itself mm-hmm. in 402 was no longer the, the seat. Okay. Uh, but some of the reasons, I've, I sort of gave you a little bit of, you know, context. Reasons for the decline and fall of the empire, I'll just tick off some things here. Soil exhaustion, hmm. plague, climatic change. Hmm, sounds familiar. <laughs> uh, and even poisoning caused by lead pipes uh, have been suggested. Uh, among the reasons for Rome's decline in manpower, vigor, and capacity to defend herself. Mm. Uh, She was, of course, being threatened on her borders and being overrun at her borders. Some blame slavery, technological failure, excessive government and taxation, the destruction of the urban middle class. I think that's a pretty important one. I think one of the things that characterizes, and we'll see this more as we go along and talk about the the sort of the economy and the life of the Middle Ages, uh, the development of seniorialism as part of the feudalism that comes out of that, it, that all comes from the destruction of a middle class, mm. which is kind of the carrier of classical culture. Uh, Kagan and Osment, in their works on this, opined that it collapsed in upon itself. The wonder being not that it fell when it did, but it lasted so long. Sure. Um, certainly Daniel's version, and I mean the prophet Daniel, yeah. would indicate, as well as Augustine's City of God, that we're to expect the rise and fall of earthly kingdoms. Yep. And Gibbon, who I mentioned the great six volumes, said the decline of Rome was the natural and inevitable effect of of immoderate greatness. So there you have it. Hmm. Now, why did some blame Christians for the fall of Rome? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I I mentioned Marcus Aurelius when I began talking about this. Marcus Aurelius, you may know, was a a renowned Stoic. Uh, His meditations, of course, have become quite uh, 
well known in that respect. Uh, and Aurelius, at his day, uh, persecuted the Christians mm-hmm. uh, uh, severely uh, in some local persecution, and blamed them. He blamed, and and you can hear in this. Uh, some, something you'll hear down through the history of the whole church. I mean, somebody like Nietzsche uh, complaining about how Christians are sheep-like and docile and all of this. Aurelius complained that the kind of of virtues, the humble virtues, the meekness of Christians, uh, I wish we were more guilty of those these days, um, that those virtues undermined the heroic virtues of the Roman Empire. Uh, and so you get this notion of Christianity as it's waxing is causing the empire to wane. And in fact, of course, that's no small charge that Augustine is seeking to answer mm-hmm. in City of God. And even after the conversion of the emperor, uh, that is to say Constantine, and um, all that's going on in the empire in the mid-fourth century, you have someone uh, like Julian, the, who's called Julian the Apostate, 361 to 363, he wants to return Rome to her pagan yeah. uh, base and pagan uh, foundation because he's convinced that the empire is imperiled by these, again, these Christians who have these virtues that are the opposite of Roman virtues. They're not virtues of heroism and strength for crying out loud these christians glory in their weakness yeah. and they talk about how much they rely on christ and uh we can't have this this is we need some we need some toughness around here and so um that's part of the reason christians get blamed often now you'll hear some say that the fall of the roman empire ultimately in 476 ad may not be as big a deal as it might seem. Why is that? Yeah, let me talk a little bit about that, what leads to the fall. Before the great invasions of the barbarians from the north and east, there had been a period of peaceful commingling of Germanic and Roman cultures. In so many ways, the Christianized tribes that we'll talk about in just a bit learn from the Romans by way of language, law, and government. So the tribes that conquered Rome, so to speak, may have been conquered by Rome, so to speak, before that, adopting a lot of their language, law, and government. And some say they were as conquered as much as they were conquerors. In the late 4th century, though, this kind of peaceful coexistence came to an end because of a great influx of Visigoths into the empire, They were effectively stampeded there in 376 by the emergence of the Huns from modern Mongolia. Uh, And these Visigoths were Aryans. They were converted, but they were Aryans. And they defeated the Romans at uh, Adrianople in 378, who were under the Eastern Emperor Valens. Having little will uh, and or ability to resist The Romans, after this, passively permitted successive waves of settlement within the very heart of of Western Europe. So the late 4th and 5th centuries saw the invasions of other tribes as well, the Vandals, the Burgundians, the Franks. Um, And in 410, the Visigoths under Alaric sacked Rome. Um, From 451 to 453, Italy suffered the invasions of Attila the Hun, Uh, And in 455, Rome was overrun by the Vandals. Uh, By the mid-5th century, power in Western Europe had passed decisively from the hands of the Roman emperors to those of the barbarian chieftains. Uh, And in 476, that's the date you asked about, the Western emperor Romulus Augustulus uh, was deposed and replaced by a local chieftain, Odovacher, uh, who himself ceded authority to Zeno, the Eastern emperor, who in turn recognized Odovacher as his Western viceroy. Mm. So by the end of the 5th century, the West was completely overrun by barbarians, um, with Ostrogoths in Italy, Franks in northern Gaul, Burgundians in Provence, Visigoths in southern Gaul and Spain, and so forth. But for all intents and purposes, uh, really by the middle of the 4th century, going back to the middle of the 4th century, the empire in the West and Rome 
had declined so much in significance. Yeah. The empire was, for all intents and purposes, really located in the east. And, of course, the empire in the east is going to continue on for uh, almost a thousand years past the 476. It's going to – Constantinople – will not fall until 1453. Mm. And that Eastern Empire really becomes known particularly and is called historically the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. And all the Byzantine Empire is in a certain sense is just the kind of the continuation of the Roman Empire in its Eastern half. So the Western half had really long before 476, more than a century before 476, had come to be rather irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Now, what about the conversion of the tribes? Can you talk about that just a little bit? You mentioned that some of them were Aryans. Uh, describe how they came to to a view on Christianity. Well, yes. Let me talk a little bit about the tribes. Uh, Theodoric, uh, who was king of the Ostrogoths, um, those are the Eastern Goths. Uh, his dates were 454 to 526. He defeated... Uh, Odovacar, who I mentioned just a moment ago, had defeated the last of the Roman emperors, Romulus Augustulus, and had, had, you know ceded authority to Zeno. Uh, and thereafter, Theodoric ruled Italy uh, with the full acceptance of the Roman people and the Christian church. And so this, you might say, began the shaping of Western Europe. So by the end of the 5th century, the Western Empire was thoroughly overrun by barbarians. Now, I hope none of our listeners think that I'm being especially politically incorrect. I'm not seeking to be. Uh, barbaros is just the Latin word for foreigners or strangers or others. Mm -hmm. And that was from the standpoint of the Romans. Uh, but these pretty much, these people I'm describing here are the ancestors. They're my ancestors. They're your ancestors, Jared. Mm -hmm. They're the ancestors of a lot of the people that are listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. these people are going to become the Europeans. Um, and so the Western Empire, and, and as I mentioned a moment ago too, they're thoroughly, not only did they become Romanized or Latinized in some ways, but they become Christians. So they come in uh, and they overrun. And yes, the, the empire falls, the empire in the West, the Roman Empire in the West falls, but Christianity is going to take root more than ever mm -hmm. among all these tribes. And so just to, again, uh, to, to tick it off here, it's the Ostrogoths in Italy, the Franks in northern Gaul, the Burgundians in Provence, the Visigoths in southern Gaul and Spain, the Vandals in Africa and the Mediterranean, the Angles and the Saxons in England. Uh, and as we've said, they learned probably more from the people uh, that they conquered uh, from the Roman side, language, law, government, from the Christian side, the faith and its attendant consequences. Now, it is the case that the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Vandals earlier were Arians. Uh, they had been converted in, at earlier points. Uh, for example, the Goths were converted in 340 under Ulfilas, the Arian, uh, but under Boniface, the great Boniface, in 720, they were converted mm -hmm. and became Orthodox Christians. The Picts were converted in 400 under Ninian. The Irish were converted in 435 under Patrick. The Franks, 496 under Clovis. The Scots, 563 under Columba. The Angles and the Saxons, 600 under Augustine of Canterbury. That's Gregory the Great. Yeah. Sent. By the way, I was going to start this series in medieval church by talking about Gregory the Great, but my esteemed colleague, Paul Ipema, uh, talked about him, and I'm very glad for that. He was able to talk quite a bit. I was going to talk about his pastoral rule, but even better to have our ministerial professor talk about that that very significant work of Gregory. But Gregory was quite a missionary, had quite a missionary impulse, mm -hmm. and was sending these folks to preach. And of course, Augustine of Canterbury went and preached there. And the Frisians in 690 under Villebrod. So um, this, is, this is what happens. Uh, and you have the rise of these different dynasties. You have the rise then of the Merovingian and the Carolingian uh, dynasties, 
uh, in in uh, the the land of the Franks, which will be land in France, in Belgium, the Netherlands, Western Germany, uh, and of course, this is all going to ultimately lead to that great uh, Carolingian Charles the Great, Charlemagne, as he's known, uh, who reigned from 768 to 814, and uh, Charlemagne. Uh, from all that we know about him, very much embraced the Christian faith. Next time, Dr. Strange wraps up this segment of church history by looking at the rise of Islam and its impact on Europe. He'll take a look at the origins of Islam, its rapid spread through the Middle East and North Africa, and its eventual clash with Christianity in Europe. Stay tuned next time to hear more. If you enjoyed today's episode, consider subscribing and sharing it with friends or family. Your support helps us bring more engaging content to your ears and helps us foster not just a community of lifelong learners, but thoughtful practitioners. I'm Jared Luchibor. Thank you for listening. We'll see you in the next episode.